At the time of this video's release, it will have been just under two years since I released my video on The Shining, the one where I tried to attribute everything in the movie to a red book on Stuart Ullman's desk. While that video is very popular and got a largely positive response, I look back on it with a heap of neuroticism, one that replenishes every time I think about it. Though I still believe that most of what I said in the video is true, I actually got one huge thing wrong. See, in that video, I tried to claim that the red book on the desk, literally titled Red Book, is the same red book that the Swiss psychoanalyst Carl Jung wrote. This would have made so much sense, because the psychoanalytic theories that brought about the contents of Jung's Red Book explain so much of what happens in the movie. However, a commenter named Jean pointed out that the book on the desk was, more likely, the same as the Red Book that most hotels and motels use for guest services. I did my best to remedy the situation. Less than a week after I posted that video, I released a follow-up video where I told everybody that the Red Book wasn't Jung's Red Book. Though a decent number of people watched that follow-up, it's only a small percentage compared to the hundreds of thousands that watched the original video. Because I feel I misled so many people, I look back on that original video with anxiety. But let me repeat, I still believe that everything else I said in that video was true. Not only do Carl Jung's theories line up well with everything that happens in the movie, there's proof that Stanley Kubrick actively used psychoanalytic concepts in his films. Hell, he states that Full Metal Jacket was basically predicated on Jung's concept of the shadow. So why wouldn't it be reasonable to ponder whether or not a movie he released seven years prior would be influenced by Jung as well? Best of all, my view was backed up by the events that took place in the sequel to The Shining, Doctor Sleep. Today, I wish to reference the things that happen in Doctor Sleep that give credence to my original viewpoint. I hope that by doing a video on Doctor Sleep, I can assuage some of my anxieties by addressing those of you that watched my original Shining video. Before I do, I want to say a couple of things. Just because Doctor Sleep is the canonical sequel to The Shining, that doesn't necessarily validate or invalidate pre-existing theories. After all, Doctor Sleep was directed by Mike Flanagan, not Stanley Kubrick, who is obviously dead. Thus, Doctor Sleep cannot possibly have integrated all of Kubrick's intentions. In the simplest terms, don't let my viewpoint discourage you from attributing multiple different meanings to The Shining. Also, I hope that quickly and publicly admitting that I got something wrong in my original video demonstrates my willingness to be wrong. If you disagree with my perceptions, please explain why in the comment section below. Finally, if you remember what I said in my original video on The Shining, and or have a good understanding of Carl Jung's concepts of archetypes and the collective unconscious, feel free to skip to this point in the video. For the next few minutes, I will be providing a recap for those that do not fall into these two categories. Needless to say, there are spoilers ahead. I often say that there are two parts of the human mind, the conscious and unconscious. What I should probably acknowledge more often, as I did in my original Shining video, is that there is a third part, one known as the hypnagogic part. The best way to understand the hypnagogic state is to liken it to sleep. When you are conscious, you are awake. When you are unconscious, you are asleep. When you are just about to cross over between these two states of mind, you are in the hypnagogic state. In this state, you might experience hallucinations things that shouldn't be there. Between the years 1913 and 1917, the aforementioned Carl Jung tried to provoke several hypnagogic states. The hallucinations he experienced were recorded in his Red Book. Now consider this. Jung believed that there was an inherent link between the mind and matter. After all, our bodies work in conjunction with our minds to move matter, and matter is what produced our minds. If we accept this link, then it's reasonable to ponder whether or not there is some material reality to the unconscious mind. If you don't know what that means, allow me to explain using an example. In my original Shining video, I make a reference to a video game known as Silent Hill, a game that was influenced by The Shining. 
In that game, the products of one's unconscious mind achieve material reality. This happens because the town of Silent Hill acts as a hypnagogic realm, a threshold between reality and unreality. Just as our minds have a hypnagogic state, so does the material world. Given that Silent Hill was inspired by The Shining, I think that the creators of that game must have noticed the same principle acted out in the movie. Except, instead of Silent Hill representing the hypnagogic state, it's the Overlook Hotel. Now you might say, wait a minute. If the products of the unconscious mind are bleeding over into the real world through the Overlook Hotel, then whose unconscious mind is bleeding? Well, it's not any single unconscious mind. Rather, it's the aforementioned concept of the collective unconscious another one of Jung's theories. In the simplest terms, Jung believed that all conscious beings emerged from a universal psychic force known as the collective unconscious. It is what gifted the universe its mind and matter, including the bodies and minds that humans possessed. Jung theorized that humans shared an inherent psychic link to not only the collective unconscious, but to each other, hence the word collective. Some people are aware of this link, and some aren't. In regards to the movie, those who are aware of this link can shine to each other. That's why Dick Halloran was able to communicate psychically with Danny. The scary thing is that this connection extends beyond those who are alive and conscious. It also extends to those who are dead and unconscious. It can also extend to people and events that we were never aware of. This is why Danny is able to see the River of Blood, a metaphor for the death of Native Americans whom Danny never met. It's also why Danny sees the decaying woman in the bathtub. There are other aspects to the collective unconscious that I will address, but I'd like to explain them while addressing the events that occur in Doctor Sleep. First of all, we see the collective psychic connection that people share with one another quite vividly in this movie. The best example is when the members of Rose the Hat's tribe, also known as the True Knot, die at the hands of Danny and his friend Cliff. She feels the pain of each of their deaths from miles away, because she was living psychically through each of them in this moment. We see this connection through the collective unconscious demonstrated with Abra and her connection to Dan and her father. There's also a subtle example which Danny references during an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. He says he got to know his father through drinking. Well, what does drinking alcohol do to you? Depending on how much you drink, it can bring you to unconsciousness. Doing this probably helped to heighten Danny's psychic abilities, bringing him closer to the spirit and memories of his dead father, which reside in the collective unconscious. Moving on from this, there's the issue of physical displacement, which occurs when the unconscious bleeds into our reality. As I pointed out in my original video, the layout of the Overlook Hotel doesn't make any physical sense. There are windows, hallways, and doors where there shouldn't be any. This reflects the nature of the collective unconscious because it resides outside of space-time. It's an effect that we also see in our dreams, when we can go from one location to the other and we do not question it. Sometimes we can go to different points in time, just like the Overlook Hotel does, when past events take place in what only seems to be the present. The same thing happens in the aforementioned Silent Hill. There, reality breaks down and takes on different forms, and even sometimes goes backwards in time. We see this breakdown of time and reality occur in Doctor Sleep as well. Abra, Danny, and Rose the Hat are able to defy space and time. Their houses move, their locations change, and they can witness past events that they weren't around for. Finally, and most importantly, the existence of the collective unconscious in the world of The Shining and Doctor Sleep is evidenced by the existence of archetypes and archetypal patterns. Remember what I said before about how the collective unconscious gifted human beings with their bodies and minds? The state of our mind, the composition of it, is determined by what Jung called archetypes. Archetypes are universal patterns to human existence. For example, a mother is an archetype because every human being has a mother. Our brains are encoded to not only recognize our mother upon birth, but also to breastfeed, a feat that we didn't learn. Other mental traits that we possess are conferred to us by our parents. 
our parents received mental traits from their parents, and so on back to the beginning of time, when all that existed were the archetypes. A good way of thinking about it in regards to the mother example is that there was a single great mother archetype at the beginning of time, and that all mothers that exist stem from that archetype. In regards to The Shining, we see references to the concept of archetypes and their influence on human behavior. For example, the archetype of the Great Mother, coined by Carl Jung and elaborated on by one of his students, Eric Neumann, can be found in the movie. Just outside of Stuart Ullman's office is a painting by a Native American artist known as Norval Morisot. No joke, the name of this painting is Great Mother. You know how I just said that the unconscious isn't bound by space-time, and how that trait influenced the layout of the Overlook Hotel? Well, the fact that the collective unconscious houses the archetypes is influencing the layout of the hotel as well. The Great Mother archetype is bleeding into our world. Want another example? You know that picture at the end that shows Jack at the July 4th party back in 1921? Want to know why Kubrick chose that photo? According to an interview that Kubrick had with a journalist known as Michel Simon, he chose that photo because every face that surrounded Jack was an archetype of the period. So no wonder the ghosts of the Overlook Hotel take on the faces of the people from that party. They're representatives of the archetypes of the collective unconscious. Best of all, Jack and his lineage represent a very specific archetype. The archetype of the negative father. The negative father is someone who crumbles under the weight of responsibility to his family. He is the opposite of the ideal father. He drinks, he's violent, and he's selfish. With every man that followed before and after him, they were susceptible to acting out this archetype and the patterns it confers. The most obvious example of this lies with Danny in Dr. Sleep. He struggles with trying to not end up like his father, or like Jack's father, or his father's father. Yet because archetypes are universal patterns, and his lineage is susceptible to the negative father archetype, he has a hard time breaking free. It seems like it's his fate to not only succumb to alcoholism, but to actually live the exact same life that Jack did. Think about it. What do we know about Jack's life? Jack was an alcoholic. So was Danny. Jack did something terrible to his family while inebriated, which motivated him to try and get sober. This was when he dislocated Danny's arm. Adult Danny almost stole money from a single mother. Soon after this event, he decided to get sober. Following this newfound sobriety, both Jack and Danny have a meeting with an employer to try and live a normal, responsible life. These meetings occur in rooms that virtually look the same. I don't think this was just a nostalgic throwback to the meeting scene in The Shining, but an actual reference to the concept of archetypes. Finally, towards the end of their lives, they find themselves back in the Overlook Hotel, tempted by alcohol. But here, there is a difference. Jack succumbs to the temptation and becomes possessed by the archetype of the negative father. Danny, however, makes the opposite choice, and thus, breaks the cycle. This decision sends a positive message to those who are haunted by a dark past or specifically by the influence of poor parenting. Though the archetypes determined our state at birth and largely determine our behavior throughout our life, it does not mean we cannot rise above. Sure, the process will be painful. It will bring about resentment like the kind we saw from Jack in The Shining. But if we don't overcome it, then we will only perpetuate the cycle of violence. Jack chose to perpetuate the archetypal pattern of the negative father, just like so many before him did, but Danny didn't, and the world became a safer place as a result. And that's why I believe Dr. Sleep confirms my original theory on The Shining. The Red Book might not have been Jung's Red Book, but the theories that underlie the contents of Jung's Red Book, namely the existence of archetypes and the collective unconscious, help explain so much of what goes on in The Shining. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Let me know in the comments section below. Make sure to hit the like button, that helps me out a lot. 
Make sure to subscribe because there's going to be a lot more juicy horror content coming out this month. Also, if you like the work I am doing here where I go above and beyond the average movie or game theory, please consider supporting me on Patreon. There are many tiers with many perks to choose from, all at affordable prices. I'll leave a link to my Patreon in the description box below. Thanks for watching and until my next video, remember to stay yellow.